Supply shortages are everywhere. Is an economic crisis inevitable? The short answer is yes. And I'm going to explain why in three simple, fast steps. Step number one, let's go over what is happening with the supply chain disruptions that are causing all of these supply shortages. To get a quick summary of what has been happening, editor, let's cut to the news. Why so many empty shelves? U.S. ports are backed up. Take a look at this. Cargo ships sitting in the sea waiting to pull into port. It's causing major U.S. retailers like Walmart, Home Depot, and Costco to charter private cargo ships in a rush to fill shelves for the holiday season. On the roads, there's a shortage of truck drivers. The White House says it's addressing the issues fueled by COVID-19, a labor shortage, and increased demand. So when we think through the government interventions and distortions in the economy we've seen in 2020 and 2021, it makes a lot of sense why we are having these issues. First of all, we have the STEMI checks going back to 2020. So people's income, Americans' income in aggregate total has actually increased since 2019, although far fewer people are working. So we have people believing that they're going to continue to get, quote unquote, free money from the government. Of course, there is no free lunch. At some point in time, we're going to have to pay the fiddler. But it's not just incomes that have gone up. It's expenses have gone down. So you didn't have to pay your rent. You didn't have to pay your mortgage for a large percentage of the American population. So although they may have to start paying their mortgage and their rent, they've been able to accumulate a lot of savings they didn't have in the past. Also, asset prices, all-time highs. Editor, throw up a chart of the S&P 500 since March of 2020, and we can see it going almost straight up. The same thing with housing prices and the same thing with cryptocurrency. So for a moment, let's put ourselves in the position of someone that's considering going back to work. Maybe let's say a truck driver that's responsible from getting those goods from the port to the grocery store so they can put them on the shelves. Well, this person has a decision to make. Their house has probably gone up by, let's say, $200,000 in value. So they see that as though they have become richer. They probably had a little bit of savings prior to the Cervasa sickness. Their stock portfolio has gone up and maybe they own some Bitcoin that has gone from $5,000 up to $60,000. So now all of a sudden on paper, their net worth has gone from, let's say $150,000 up to six, seven, eight hundred thousand. Do you think they're going to go back to work? Most likely not. So what ends up happening is we have supply shortages of not just goods and services, but it's really a result of a shortage of workers producing goods and services and also workers available to transport the stuff from the port to the grocery store. But for a moment, let's go back and focus on the fact that we're producing a lot less here in the United States, but demand is even higher, meaning there are more dollars now on the balance sheet of the non-bank entities in the real economy, the average Joe and Jane, the small and mid-sized business, than there was back in 2019. So you have people producing less stuff, but demand staying the same, if not going higher. Well, if we're not producing the stuff we're consuming, who is? This guy. It's going to be China and countries outside of the United States. Well, if they're importing more stuff, that means our trade deficit is going up. That's going to put more pressure on the global supply chains, meaning those ships that are bringing the goods from China to, let's say, Los Angeles, and then the port operators, and then the truck drivers bringing those goods to the grocery stores. But let's look at a chart so we can see the magnitude of how much the trade deficit has increased, therefore the magnitude 
of the additional pressure that we're putting on the global supply chains themselves. This is a chart going back to 2000 or, or the end of the 1990s, let's say. It goes all the way to today. And on the left, it actually starts at a negative $80 billion and goes up to zero. This is our trade deficit. So in the late 90s, we are almost flat. We would import about the same amount as we would export. But then going down to 2005, the trade deficit became worse and worse and worse. It actually gets better during the GFC. So why is that? Because we saw demand decrease because we went into a recession, but yet everyone was still working, creating the same amount of goods and services. It's the complete opposite of what we saw in the recession in 2020. After the GFC, the trade deficit gets worse again and then kind of flatlines until we get to the Cervasa sickness and then it really gets worse. Today, the trade deficit is at an all-time high. But what's important to note is it went from about $40 billion a month to where it is today at almost $80 billion a month. So the trade deficit has almost doubled in a very short time frame. When you combine this additional strain on the global supply chains and the fact that we have fewer workers willing to work at the ports and transport the goods, it all makes sense that when you go to your local grocery store or your local retailer, you see less stuff on the shelves. In fact, here's some pictures of where I shop right here in Phoenix, the Whole Foods, and you can see many of the shelves are completely barren. Although it may be just an inconvenience right now, into the future, if this problem gets worse, which I believe it will, we may get to the point where there's nothing to buy at that grocery store or that retailer at all. Now let's go over a visual of what's happening so we can really get our heads around why we're seeing these supply chain disruptions and the shortages. So it starts with a very simple economy. We've got my good buddies, the Farmer Freds. This guy grows cows, this guy grows cotton, this guy grows corn, and they have employees. Now, unfortunately, right now, they can't get very good help. So their employees are limited to Moody the Millennials, or Moody's, I guess we'll call them. <laughs> so there's a Moody the Millennial that works for the guy growing cows, the guy growing cotton, and the guy growing corn. But the government comes in and says, hey, booties, we don't want you to go to work. It's way too dangerous. So we'll go ahead and pay you to stay home. Plus, you don't have to pay your rent. Plus, you don't have to pay your mortgage payment. And oh, by the way, the Fed's going to come in and do $120 billion a month worth of quantitative easing. So if you do have stocks, they're going to go to the moon. And if you do have cryptocurrency, NFTs, you're going to increase your wealth by 10 times, 100 times what little wealth you had to begin with, Moody the Millennial. So Moody is looking at their options and saying, why on earth do I want to go back and work for Farmer Fred? So if at the beginning, this farmer is growing, let's say, one cow per year, this one, three pieces of cotton, this one, three pieces of corn, and that is supplying the entire real economy now, since they don't have any workers, they have to produce all the stuff themselves, but they can only produce half of what they're doing before. So instead of a full cow going into the real economy, now we only have half a cow. Instead of three pieces of cotton and corn, now we only have one piece. But let's remember demand in the real economy is the same, if not higher, because the government sent out all those checks and reduced the average Joe and Jane's monthly expenses dramatically while the Fed increased the value of their home and their stock portfolio and any cryptocurrency they had. So bottom line is demand up, supply down. This is one reason why we've seen significant price increases almost across the board since the Cervasa sickness in 2020. But we still get the goods. It's not like those shelves are completely barren. There is some stuff there. When you go to Walmart, 
Home Depot, Target, or your local grocery store. So what happens is China has to work double time. And I'm using China as a placeholder for all of these countries that import those goods into the United States. So what we were producing before, now we are importing from China. So we get that half a cow we need, the two pieces of corn and the two pieces of cotton. But this is a lot more than we were importing before. So all of these ships coming in from China, bringing in the stuff, the goods, get clogged up at the port because the port isn't large enough to handle all of the goods we are importing because we're producing far less at home. Oh, but wait, there is more. Unfortunately, the same worker shortage that we're seeing in the entire economy also affects the ports and the truckers. There's fewer portsmen and there's fewer truckers to handle the loads or the additional loads coming in from China. And this creates a further bottleneck when we're trying to get the goods from California distributed throughout the United States. But the economic distortions that have been created by the government interventions don't stop there. Remember, we've got far more regulation today than we did back in 2019 when we didn't have all of these supply chain issues. As a quick example, we talked about how we have fewer truckers, but in California, starting in January of 2020, they just started enforcing a law that wiped out pretty much 20% of the trucks that were on the road. And at a certain point, you can only regulate people so much before they just get fed up and quit. A great example of this is the gentleman who commented on one of my YouTube videos on the Rebel Capitalist channel yesterday talking about this trucking issue. And editor, go ahead and throw up the quote or the comment, and you can see that this gentleman is just completely fed up with all the regulations and all the people who are voting to restrict what he can and can't do. He's 61 years old. So he said, you know what? I'm done. I quit. I'm retiring. Although he only represents one of these truckers, my guess is there's a lot of them that we used to depend on to get these goods from the port to the grocery store that would fall into the same category. But it's not just the trucking industry that's being absolutely crushed by the government micromanaging everything they do. It's really broad-based. A perfect example of that is the slimiest politician that any of us have ever seen in our lives, that would be Gavin Newsom, in California, coming up with a law stating that even little small toy stores in a strip mall have to have an aisle dedicated to gender neutral toys. When you take this type of philosophy in the government and spread it across all industries, what you're left is a society that's producing far fewer goods and services. Therefore, by definition, it's constantly getting poorer and the standard of living is going down. But unfortunately, it doesn't end there because we have a very tight labor market. We all know that job openings are very close to all time highs. And we can see that we have labor shortages just due to the fact that we have shortages and everything else. And we have these supply chain disruptions. But what is the government doing? They're telling every single employer with over 100 employees that they basically have to fire 10 to 20 percent of their staff. This is complete insanity. The question becomes, will it continue? Step number two, will the problem continue or will it actually get worse in the future? In step number one, we talked about these components that are contributing to the supply chain disruptions and the supply shortages that we're seeing all over the United States. But when you look at these components, we can kind of put them into a feedback loop to get a better understanding of how this may play out in the future. So it's a, a doom loop, or we'll call it a doom vortex for this video. It's what I usually call them on my whiteboard videos. Unfortunately, it's not much of a loop. It's more of a 
Apple. So we'll call it the Doom Vortex Apple. <laughs> it starts with wealth in aggregate total in the United States increasing dramatically since 2020. But I want to point out, this is fool's gold because it's not wealth that was created by additional productivity. It was simply wealth that was created by more central planning, stimmy checks, and more quantitative easing and government meddling in the real economy. So at some point in time, the amount of wealth Americans think they have, or the amount of wealth they think they gained in 2020 and 2021, will come crashing down by the same amount, if not more, than it went up over the past year and a half. This fool's gold type of wealth that was caused by additional central planning has caused a labor shortage. This labor shortage means that we produce less stuff in the United States and our ability to transport that stuff from the port to the grocery store, logistics has also decreased. As a result, the trade deficit has exploded. Now, I don't really like Fox News. I'm not a big fan of Tucker Carlson. I dislike all news outlets equally very similar to the way I view politicians. <laughs> but I must admit that Tucker Carlson said it very well. He said the United States has basically turned into an outpost for China, where we are completely dependent on them and other foreign countries for our supply lines. Editor, let's cut to the clip. Maybe you've seen the pictures of queues of cargo ships strung out into the Pacific trying to get into American ports to unload their containers. You will hear this scene described as part of something called the global supply chain, but that intentionally understates what it actually is. What you're looking at are America's supply lines. At this point, we're effectively an outpost, totally dependent on a faraway headquarters for the things we need to live. So when the trade deficits continue to increase, this will put more pressure on the supply chains than we are already seeing. What is the government gonna do? They're going to come in and intervene even more, creating more economic distortions, malinvestments, and a misallocation of resources, and really hamper the productivity of small and mid-sized businesses, like we're seeing with all of these regulations in California, with the trucking industry, and with the broad-based economy especially when these mandates go into place that will reduce the existing labor pool even further. So more interventions means the real economy will get worse. If the real economy gets worse, then we have more central planning, more stimmy checks, more stimulus, and more Fed quantitative easing and artificially low interest rates. And then the process just feeds on itself and it gets worse and worse and worse. Oh, time out. Let's think of an actual solution. What if the government stopped doing all of these things that are creating the problem in the first place? Well, let's think that through. So the government stops deficit spending. The stop the stimmy checks. What's going to happen to the incomes of the average American? It's going to absolutely plummet. What if the Fed stops quantitative easing? and artificially low interest rates to the point where we see negative real rates today in the US economy. Those are the interest rates or the yields adjusted for the rate of inflation. We would see asset prices like the stock market go down by 50, 60, 70%. Housing would go down over the next four or five years at a rate very consistent with what we saw from 2006 to 2012. In other words, the GFC. And then if people are all of a sudden taking less and less risk, what happens to the overall market cap of cryptocurrency and things like NFTs? It absolutely collapses. So let's just take a step back for a moment and put things in the simplest terms possible. I'll ask a question to all of you watching this video right now. What do you think would happen to the US economy if the stock market went down by 50 or 60% and stayed there for the next 10 years. In addition to that, the housing market goes down by 50 or 60% and 
and stays there for the next 10 years. And then for all the young people, I'm not going to say all the young people, but for a lot of the young people, what happens to their purchasing power if the cryptocurrency market goes down by 80, 90 percent? Just think about what that would do to the level of spending in an economy where 70 percent of GDP is consumption. Now that you're visualizing what that would actually look like, let's layer on the fact that the regulations that we're seeing from the government will most likely increase into the future, especially with all of the ESG narratives that we're seeing and the administration pushing for bigger and bigger government, more and more central planning. In the US, there are really only two possible outcomes. Number one is the central planners continue to do what they've done and it puts us into this doom vortex where the standard of living goes down through a process of having access to fewer goods and services and a significant amount of price inflation. This would look something like Mexico or Argentina as far as the standard of living in the United States going down to that level. And if that sounds shocking, you've got to remember that what would happen to the United States if we could only consume at a level at which we produce. When you look at things in those terms, it's not a stretch to see how the United States in 10 years could look very similar to Argentina or Mexico. The second option is for the central planners to just stop what they're doing. Stop doing the things that are creating the problems in the first place. Unfortunately, like we said earlier, if they stop the deficit spending, stop the QE and the artificially low interest rates, that takes us to an environment that looks very similar to the Great Depression in the 1930s. So whether our standard of living goes down as a result of deflation, or it goes down as a result of inflation, we come to the same point. And right about now, your friend and family member Fred is probably saying, George, you don't know what you're talking about. At a worst case scenario, the United States will look a lot like Japan in the future. Well, I've got a rebuttal for your friend and family member Fred. Japan would be the best case scenario for the United States, and the probability of us going that direction is very, very low. Why? Because Japan actually produces stuff. Here in the United States, we're simply an outpost of China and all these foreign countries that make up our supply lines. Step number three, what is the end game? In step number two, I discussed a lot of the reasons why I think an economic crisis in the United States is inevitable. But unfortunately, when I look into the future, I see many other things that could lead to an economic collapse. Let's first start off by going over a timeline of the, got to keep this YouTube friendly. We'll call them sicknesses <laughs> we have seen since 2000. First, it was a SARS outbreak, we'll call it. Next, we had swine flu or H1N1. Then we had MERS. Then we had Zika. Then we had Ebola. And in 2020, we had the Cervasa sickness. So what we have to do is ask ourselves, what's next? Because these illnesses, let's say, pop up every three or four years. So if history is any guide, we should see something else in 2023, 2024, or 2025. And how will the government respond to it then? If now we've set a precedence where the government comes in and locks everyone in a cage, forces you to shut down your small and mid-sized business and then prints money like there is no tomorrow, what are they going to do when we have the next round of XYZ illness 
Now that the governments and the central planners control society through fear and the media, I think there's a very good chance that the next time we see something like this in the future, that they take the extreme type of measures we saw in 2020 and 2021. And I'm not the only one thinking this could be a significant problem moving forward. Editor, let's cut to a clip of Jordan Peterson. We've seen throughout the West, and maybe it's exacerbated in the case of Australia, the willingness to dispense with civil liberties on the domestic front in the face of the pandemic threat. And I wonder first about the legality of of such moves. It, it, It seems to me that if the lockdowns and the mandatory vaccination policies are in fact constitutionally valid in countries like Australia and Canada and perhaps the US and, and of course Europe, that our civil liberties aren't very well protected at all. And then I also wonder what would happen to us, what will happen to us, broadly speaking, when the next influenza pandemic sweeps through. Like now that we've established lockdowns as acceptable, what level of threat justifies their imposition. But unfortunately, I don't think the next Cerveza sickness is where the story actually ends. Let's go over a chart of carbon emissions going back to 1975. On the left, oh, and this is 5250. Editor, go and help me out with that. Can you throw a 5250 in there really quick? I accidentally erased it when my back rubs up against it. (laughs) But it starts at 4250, goes up to 6250. And trust me, 5250 is right here in the middle. But we can see that it really has gone up significantly since 1975 to a point right around the GFC. Then it comes down to a level that we saw that was consistent with where we were back in the 1970s around 2020. But during the Cerveza sickness and the lockdowns, the government-induced lockdowns, where they locked you in a cage and they wouldn't allow you out of the house. They forced you to shut down your business. They wouldn't even allow you to walk out on the beach. Something very similar to what we still see today in countries like Australia. The carbon emissions dropped dramatically, as you would expect. About 10 to 12 percent. Well, let's think through what the agenda is of the global elite at the World Economic Forum, the IMF, and a lot of these corporate Davos types that we see sucking up to Klaus Schwab and his cronies all the time. Their main mantra going into 2030, remember the Great Reset Agenda, you will own nothing and you'll be happy. It all revolves around climate change. So is it any stretch to think these global elite won't use this as an argument for further lockdowns into the future, even if we don't get another round of the Cerveza sickness? You can hear the argument already playing out in the media and with the politicians, the useful idiots. Well, during the Cerveza sickness, we had to lock everyone in a cage to save grandmothers and grandfathers. But now, for the next 50 years, the next 100 years, we need to lock everyone in a cage to save humanity. And as 2020 has shown us, although these lockdowns may improve the air quality, they absolutely decimate the economy. So as always, it comes down to a question of probabilities. I think the probability is high we get an economic crisis as a result of what the government has been doing over 2020 and into 2021. But as far as the government's response to the next Cerveza sickness, who knows? I think you need to come to your own conclusions. And then taking it a step further, are we going to see global lockdowns in the name of climate change? Again, a matter of probabilities. I'll let you come to your own conclusions. For more content that'll help you build wealth and thrive in a world of -of out-of-control central banks and big governments, check out this playlist.
right here. And I will see you on the next video.